Hello and welcome. This podcast episode is focusing on cybersecurity and farming and agriculture. Today's panellists are Rob May, who's a presenter, speaker and director of Ramsec IT. Hi, Rob. How are you? I'm good. Thank you, Chris. And we have Emily Trevelyan, a cybercrime detective that's with the Southeast Regional Organised Crime Unit. Hello, Emily. Hi, Chris. So glad you're joining us today. Um, as I said, it's a podcast session, which um, we're going to ask a few questions. Feel free to comment on areas where you have some expertise, uh, but we'll kick off with the questions. So, Rob, when we talk about this sector, the farming and agriculture sector, why do you think this um, is an attractive sector for cyber criminals to target? Well, I think against a background of, you know, big rises in, in cyber crime, you know, we've seen more attacks in the first six months of this year than in the previous two years combined and specifically in agricultural businesses a rise of 60 percent of um, agricultural businesses reporting attacks compared to 45 percent in the previous year the industry is one that has a high reliance on technology whether that's sales and purchasing or you know wi-fi for the farm or for the rental properties on the farm and of course computer controlled farming equipment uh, agriculture 4.0 sees that reliance on connected devices whether that's irrigation systems control of equipment management of microclimates or disease disease detection there's a big reliance on technology And yet, typically, there's little investment in cyber resilience. And some of these farms have really big turnovers, but very few technical staff doing the IT bit. And it makes it easy picking. You're so right. I mean, I've seen some of my observations. It used to be that the farmer was out in the tractor all day and actually they need to be working whilst doing those things. And they have smartphones now which can control devices that their emails are coming in. So certainly I've seen some of the risk is no different to a small business where they could be exploited through a wish a, a phishing email um or they need to turn on certain bits of equipment at certain times of the day and you're right they're reliant on those mobile phone signals and like most small business owners they are head of sales head of advertising head of everything aren't they and uh, very little have cyber security expertise absolutely and there's a lot of automated products within the farming community which again all get connected to the internet and certainly from one of my basic point of views is that update your devices whether or not it is a a milking machine whether or not it's a temperature sensor whether or not it's actual laptop or smartphone make sure they're updated because it can do a lot of protection when you are even asleep i think also it depends on what the type of farm is as well you know potentially you've got hacktivists who don't like the way that they're farming poultry for example and then they want to attack you know and those chicken sheds are all computer controlled in terms of feed and heat and water and you know there can be a target from that perspective as well yeah you're you're, you're dead right i mean left is doesn't get on with right and right doesn't get on with left and we're always stuck in the middle to fix things aren't we uh yeah so Emily, then, what types of cyber attacks do businesses in these sectors tend to face then? I know we've got some common ones, haven't we, which is like business email compromise and texting scams and phone scams and malware and phishing. Is there a favourite for the farming community? I think, to be honest, we need to put it into the context of the current situation we're facing as well. You know, um, Rob's mentioned this increase in technology across the farming and agriculture sector because of the nature of the business that they need to provide. But of course, businesses are adapting at the moment, especially around the pandemic and the way that that's changed businesses operating. As well as Brexit, you know, the, the way that trade deals are being agreed, maybe not moving things around so freely as they were able to before. And that is having an impact on the way that offenders are attacking these kind of businesses. Um, I mean, phishing attacks are something that we're seeing frequently anyway, but have become much more prevalent since the pandemic. I think offenders are trying to find other ways to commit offences that avoid that need for them to having have to leave their houses as they were able to before. 
And the problem with this is that there are services that can be provided at very low cost through a quick search on either the surface web or on the dark web that will allow thousands of emails to be sent out at the click of a button. So it's a very cost effective and um, potentially high gain way of targeting businesses of this nature because they're so reliant on just one person within that organization clicking the right link or following the right hyperlink within an email and allowing them then access to that network to go on to commit further offenses you know and um, be it hacking accessing data or maybe spreading malware for example um, larger businesses with a higher cash turnover or a larger, more exploitative infrastructure can also be targeted maybe using spear phishing as well. So um, these type of emails or texts adapted using social engineering to seem specifically relevant then to someone high up in that business or organisation, um, maybe the MD or CEO of a company, causing them to take actions that they might not usually take. Um, another attack we do see, maybe not specific to farming, but businesses in general, is um, ransomware attacks. So malware is introduced onto a network that blocks access to data unless a ransom is paid. And quite often offenders are relying on a limited system of backing up data. As we're talking about within farming and agriculture, um, they have 101 priorities, which probably aren't their cybersecurity. So they're relying on that lack of backing up data um, to exploit that need for them then to pay a ransom and get that data back as quickly as possible. Now, of course, we can't guarantee that that data is going to be released should that ransom be paid, of course. Um, but the amount of technology that is in use that relies on that need for an operational IT network is exactly what is going to cause these offenders to exploit businesses of that nature. Very good points there. And I know the, the farming community are probably working on like a, a just in time process, aren't they? Because certain things have to happen at certain times or certain things could go past the best before date. So it's quite critical, some of um, their processes. But certainly, yeah, I'd, Phishing email campaigns is a classic, isn't it? And I'm sure there's um, I'm obviously I've not too much farming experience myself, but I know that certain time deadlines for tax returns, there's certain deadlines for access to government grants for farming monies that the criminals will exploit that. So they will send you the phishing emails and the spear phishing emails on those particular deadlines because they know you're going to be expecting those emails. So if they pretend to be a legitimate outlet, send you the email and you're not going to send the money or the application with sensitive financial details or sensitive personal details on it you're going to be sending it to the criminal instead so it's again i guess a bit of due diligence isn't it on um, your part that if it's out of the blue it's too good to be true is one of the expressions i got told for phishing emails sounds a bit corny but um it's true isn't it if something's it too good to be true and it's the nature of these companies that they want to promote their services and what they can do and generate that that income potential. And all of that information then is potentially information that can be used to exploit them because they're saying about their, you know, when their products are, are available to purchase or to, to sell on. Um, so, yeah, it's being aware of what information you have out there as well, I'd say, uh, to prevent that exploitation. Definitely. So we've talked about some risks. How about some mitigation then? Rob, what do you reckon? A couple of top things that uh, a farmer or small business owner of an agricultural business should do to enhance their cybersecurity. What's your favourites? OK, and look, whether whether this is for you and your farm or whether this is for you as an individual thinking about your home life and your, you know, protecting your kids or your parents or whatever it is, I, th I think all of the good things that we can do uh, remain the remain the same people need to have an understanding of the different types of social engineering you know that typically in the industry we talk about the four vectors of social engineering so phishing so scams via email vishing so voice solicitation smishing which is you know phishing via text message um, and of course impersonation which is is physical it, it's people pretending to be people that they're not in order to get access to your systems so people need to understand the different types of social engineering in order to understand it 
we need to train people. You know, all staff need to have a certain level of, of training and awareness. And it doesn't matter at, at what level. And it doesn't matter whether you use a computer or just, a mo you know, a mobile phone. You, you are at risk. Of course, two-factor authentication, you know, we can't. We can't continue to bang that drum enough, but still people don't do it. Jeff Bezos, CEO of Amazon, got hacked earlier this year through WhatsApp just because he hadn't turned on two-factor authentication in his account settings. So simple, and yet people mm. aren't doing it. Making sure that your hardware and your software is updated and, and patched. You know, how many cyber attacks do we see where actually, if they were up to date with their patching, they wouldn't have been able to have been breached. Um, you know, make sure you're not using default passwords on your on your hardware and your you know your Wi-Fi routers and that kind of thing. And uh, to Emily's point earlier about ransomware, I think that backup is vital. But I try and encourage people not to talk about backup but to talk about recovery and to really understand what their recovery position is so that they don't need to pay the ransom um and you know take this seriously don't don't think that it's not going to happen to you because chances are it is so so maybe a standard like cyber essentials which is you know a really good best practice standard to look at and it is easily attainable um, would be a good course of action as well. It's definite starter for 10. I advocate that completely cyber essentials. Um, some of the control security settings in there do cover off the basics. And we certainly know that some of the basic cyber security controls will stop the majority of cyber crime. And it covers off things like 2FA and better passwords um, and having your antivirus you might have it but you might have forgotten to turn it on which is even more annoying um but certainly yeah cyber essentials and those eligible companies out there as well once you've achieved cyber essentials you're actually entitled to free cyber insurance which is another bonus of the cyber essential scheme so yes some total good points there so uh why are cyber criminals targeting the machinery and technology used in farming and agriculture do you want to pick this one up emily yeah, absolutely. Um, I've never worked in farming and agriculture myself, um, but for as long as I've been a police officer, there have been groups targeting specifically expensive machinery and equipment on, you know, farms, small holdings, um, normally through burglaries and violent robberies. As time goes on, methods are being put in place to limit the damage, damage caused um, and property lost through crimes of that nature. So we are getting better at those sort of um, physical attempts at stealing property or taking property on site. Um, and no doubt every farm, small holding, stable, factory across the country have some provisions in place, be it sort of CCTV, electric gates, enforced locks, etc., to prevent against crimes of property theft. But sadly, I think a cyber attack is rarely at the forefront of concern in an industry such as farming and agriculture, as we've already talked about in the um, previously. And I think with the increased pressure that farming faces with sort of dropping prices for crops and things, unpredictable weather affecting yields, other such issues, it's only natural that more farmers are turning to that advanced technology and robotics to assist in those processes. So even if people are aware of a level of cyber security around their main ICT, these extra devices being brought in are most likely unsecure. Um, offenders can therefore access those devices relatively easily and therefore access financial data, which will enable them to get exactly what they want. I think as well, the pressures faced by this industry through the COVID-19 pandemic and changes to the trade deals through Brexit, like we spoke about earlier, have also caused those extra financial burdens on businesses who are increasingly turning to government grants and loans. So again, it's it's a perfect time, like we mentioned, with that spear phishing targeted attacks. It's being exploited by cyber criminals who are now targeting the farming industry by promising these grants and loans, but instead taking that that from them in the form of these scams. I think as well within the farming and agriculture, there are is a lot of money moving out all the time as well, being paid out on a regular basis for product, product services, equipment. 
And that again provides an opportunity for offenders to attack email systems, um, engineer invoices to be paid to nefarious accounts. It's an attractive industry, I think, to target due to the large quantities of money generated. So the reward to be gained by these offenders compared to probably the perception of maybe low cyber and digital awareness. It makes machinery and technology used in this sector a really attractive prospect, I think, to offenders. Very valuable points there. Certainly, I know that there are nice bits of shiny technology which are on farmyards these days. Um, tractors, I, I know they're very expensive and all the other pieces of equipment. And I know that people were quite keen to get those devices connected to the Internet. So one of the ones that I definitely know for sure is that privacy controls on all of these different devices, make sure they're not set to public, being visible to anyone. Make sure they're only visible to those that are authorised to view it, which is normally yourself and your staff. If it is like social media accounts, just make sure they're locked down to just your friends and family only again, so that if you do take, take pictures of expensive equipment, not old anybody can come across those and see exactly where they are on your, your premises and what you have. Um, so they know to go looking for it. Um, so, yeah, have a look at the privacy settings on all of the devices and just make sure they're shut down and only available to those that need legitimate business need for it. Um, is there anything you wanted to add on that one, Rob? At all? No, I don't think so. I, You know, the we have this increased use of of technology as as you both have just alluded to and uh again it, it's not just farming and ag agriculture but people don't think about the security of connected devices whether that's on the farm in the field or in the house you know the, the, there's the joke about the s in in iot stands for security and and, and so it is Pe people just don't think about it they they set you know uh metaphorically take things out of the box and and start to use them and they work and then they don't think about thinking how can we further lock this down and you know to emily's point if it was a physical building it's far more obvious to think about how do we secure it and and control the security it's dead right it's like the Christmas present, isn't it? Just eager to unwrap it and use it and then forget about setting it up correctly. Um, I guess where does the, the South East Cyber Resilience Centre stand for all of this? Um, how can we help businesses improve their cyber security? Well, we, we've we been set up by the Home Office last year um, to respond to the need to make um, cyber security less complex and try and demystify the jargon of it, make it accessible and to all that currently find cybersecurity products and services probably unaffordable. So we've established connections with all the local universities in the southeast, and we focused on those universities that have cybercrime computer science degrees on their portfolios. And we've onboarded um, about a dozen students. Um, they're amazing at what they do. They're very much young, gifted and talented individuals. Um, and we've taken on those that can cover off the technological side of things. So they know how computers work and they can electronically take them to pieces and put them back together and configure them safely. We've got some students that like looking at processes. So looking at your policies, whether you have policies in place, um, they will review them and see if they're fit for purpose or whether they're just too heavy or too light. Because um, I've certainly seen some policies, like an instant response policy, that's about 52 pages long. I know most people don't read them. You don't get past page two or three, do you, before you lose interest. It's just a, a very long black and white document. So they need to be read, have some readability, need to be readable. And then we've got some other students that are good at trying to change cultures within organisations. And I know, Rob, you covered off um, security awareness training earlier on that all employees, we shouldn't have this assumption that everyone knows what to do with computers. The Information Commissioner's Office has come to that sort of conclusion as well, that all new employees or new starters at a business should have some sort of training within one month of being there. And all organisations should actually have an annual programme, whether it's a refresher programme or just a, a programme that teaches their staff about the right and wrongs of computers. It just needs to be in place, rather like we do take um, health and safety, 
um, fire alarm testing and first aid. We take that for granted now, don't we? Wherever we go, there's an expectation. I need to know where the fire exits, the fire extinguishers and the first aid kits are. I need to know how to use them when it starts to go wrong. And we should sort of have that concept with computers because us humans panic, don't we? When we don't, when we don't know what to do or a list of instructions to follow, we tend to panic. So let's help them and give them an aid memoir. Um, so that's where the Cyber Resilience Centre can help out. So all of our stuff's available on the internet. But um, I guess last question, there was a cyber attack early this year, which was a big deal for the farm and agricultural sector. Um, and it was known as the JBS attack. Um, do you want to articulate on this one, Rob? What you see is the risk, the learning lessons, the points, how we could move on and try and stop a repeat of that one? Hmm. OK, um, thanks, Chris. Um, <laughs> I think I think there's two things with the JBS attack. The first is the scale of it. Um, it was believed to come out of Russia, but J JBS, 150 meat processing plants in 15 countries. It's the world's largest meat supplier supplying, you know, supermarkets and McDonald's, and they they claim to process 25 percent of all beef consumed in America. I mean, huge worldwide uh, organization. And they had a cyber attack, which was a ransomware attack. And if you've got if you've got no IT, that just stops all of your processing equipment from working. It stops your sales, it's, um, sales and billing you know, and, and even down to the, the simple basics of it stopping staff from, from being paid. So I guess issues and awareness within within this sector, you know, it, it raises awareness of, of ransomware um, again across the, the agricultural sector. Um, it raises that whole issue of the knock on impact of supply chain. And, and what happens when su supply chain is impacted and where you've got scarcity of resources, what does that do to to pricing? And we're seeing lots of pricing issues in, in the agricultural sector at the moment. Um, you know, I, I was talking, in fact, I was talking to a farmer recently about the amazing eye-watering price increases in, in fertilizer just astonishing and he was saying i can't grow crops if i don't have fertilizer but fertilizer has gone up from 150 pounds a ton to sort of 650 pounds a ton it's absolutely huge now with that has come scams with you know um smishing type scams where people are are selling fertilizer and some of look some of some of it's legit. There are some farmers who are now selling their fertilizer because they can make more money selling that than they can growing the crops and the, the yield that they'll get from the crops. But but wherever there's a business, as we know, there will always be a scam. And it's it's having that awareness. And I think the other thing is, you know, it really highlights across the sector that everybody is being attacked and we're, we are all being attacked all of the time and my big question for any type of organization is is how prepared are you you know if you were to have an attack right now what would you do do you know what to do do your staff need to know what to do and chris you were just talking about that that incident response plan mm. absolutely that within any organization People need to calmly be able to react to the inevitable cyber attack. Practice makes perfect is one of the expressions I grew up with. Um, but yeah, because the farming industry is you, you can't stop the cattle needing attention and you can't stop crops growing. It, it all needs attention, whether you've got computers supporting you, making life easier. But when the computers are not working, all of that stuff still needs your attention. So what is your plan B? Having one in place will allow you to 
calmly react to whatever's um, happening in front of you, whatever's unfolding, because you've got that plan. Um, but knowing how long could you survive without computers um, assisting you, and knowing what else, who else you can lean on, because it's we I think we refer to it as a supply chain attack. So if what do you do when the lights go off? You just get the candles out, don't you? You've got a plan. Um, so let's have that plan ready for when the computers are not there because I think I adapted my talks a couple of years ago to stop talking about if you get a cyber attack and I was changing that to when you get a cyber attack um, because that's currently how it is sadly but yeah um, that kind of covers off our session on farming and agriculture today but certainly have either of you got anything you want to add to the questions we've covered today I think on top of what you guys have said about having a plan of action as well, I used to be a trainer. Um, I used to train the cybercrime course in in policing. And as as with any other industry, trying to educate police officers in cyber and digital is, is hard because people come from sort of all different backgrounds, all different sort of um, generations of, of use with technology. And I think the same is going to apply across any other sector um, in the country, you know, including farming and agriculture. And there's going to come a point where people won't understand what they need to do, perhaps. They don't understand ICT. They don't understand how their network works. But another key consideration is who are you going to go to when that eventuality happens? We can't expect everyone to know everything that they need to know to keep their business safe. Just make sure you have someone's number in your phone or a contact that you can trust to turn to for that advice. Um, you know, IT managers, whoever that might be, um, so that you know where to go to should that, you know, worst case scenario happen because you can't be expected to know everything all the time. Dead right. Dead right. No, I completely agree. And also to add to that, I think that when we talk about training, this isn't a one off thing. Uh, you know, you've got to keep drip feeding the knowledge. It, especially when you're training somebody where this isn't their world. Harvard University did a study that said that an intelligent person needs to hear something six times before they get it. So wow. you can't you can't just do one training exercise and think that's it. My staff know what they're doing now. You've, you've got to. Uh, and the other angle to that, as, as you will know, Emily, from your training background is we all have different learning preferences. So one approach will work for one person, but it won't work for everybody in the business. And let's be honest, things change so quickly in the world of technology, doesn't it? So what might have been right last week might not be right next week. So it is absolutely an ongoing process. Absolutely. Is. Well, thanks you two for the help on this podcast. I certainly know our listeners have gained some valuable tips from your understanding and contributions today. But for those out there, please remember Cyber Resilience Centre for South East is here to protect your organisation against cybercrime by providing affordable testing products and training services where needed. So join us at www.secrc.co.uk for some more information. Thank you.